Thanks for coming by. I feel like a lot's happened. This is good. A you lot know? has happened. A lot has happened. I can't remember what had happened before the last one. What I do remember from the last one is that Bitcoin was at what two two grand or two twenty five about two thousand. I was disappointed that I had sold a bunch at twelve hundred. So let's not talk about it anymore. Well, at least you bought <laughs> some. I mean, you had some. I sold about a third of it, right, to invest in something that I could have waited and invested in later, because I was on the fence. I almost said I don't feel like dealing with hiring a lawyer to review the situation and and, yeah. and i said nah no nah, i should be responsible i got way too much in bitcoin right now i should sell a bunch of it <laughs> isn't that yeah. bad timing yeah. i could have waited and said the same thing <laughs> and had a ferrari i'll stop talking on top of I'll the st- other thing but here's the whole point of that is i kept plenty and i got plenty more yeah so you're what, in I, do i need to have I'm happy. You're the last person who should be complaining. I should about not be Bitcoin. complaining, even though I did just sell a stupid amount. I could have bought one Bitcoin. Ugh. Well, if you knew, it's always hindsight. Yeah, of course. I mean, always, you, if you wanted to hold more, you would have had to say, oh, I'm willing to risk all this money. Yeah. <laughs> and no, you know, it's like, what's your risk level? It's if you're a lunatic and you, you know, my risk tolerance is very low. You're doing better if you're a lunatic right now. Yeah, that's for sure. That's a lesson. Get ready. There's going to be a lot of lessons in this episode. Welcome to Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. Device Squad, fighting crimes against enterprise mobility worldwide. Bad UI, frustrating user experiences, poorly conceived mobile strategies, we defeat them all. This podcast series will cover all aspects of enterprise mobility, including strategy, development, design, testing, and more. My name is Steve Brickman. I'm a mobile strategist and UX architect with Propellix. First, a brief history of the company. Founded in 2011, Propellix is a mobile strategy consultancy helping enterprises worldwide devise true mobile strategies and develop world-class mobile applications across all industry verticals. Propellix clients include large companies like Amway, Bright Horizons, Bank of Montreal, Dubai Airports, Family Dollar, DLL, Cintas, Merck, and many more. Propellix menu of services includes eight different mobile kickstarts, covering everything from mobile strategy and road mapping to MCOE to UI UX design to mobile testing strategy, along with soup to nuts, app design development and support. Additionally, Propellix offers three homegrown enterprise mobile products. But I did want to ask you about this one day. Yeah. Oh, we are? We are recording. I always thought that that's a sign of a good podcast is when the people who are on it don't know that it started. Exactly. Which is stupid because I'm talking right into the mic. Like, I just want to be ready in case it starts, but I didn't think it started yet. <laughs> that's my secret sauce. All right. Well, let's talk about this day, which happened. What is this? November- when was this Oh, you crash? got news items coming up. When was this crash? It was just like last week, right? Yeah. Just but November I mean, you know, when 8th? it crashes to a point... That is way above where it was, say, weeks ago. Is that really a crash, or is that just, uh, you know, the nothing moves in a straight line? There's a clear upward movement. A correction. <laughs> yeah, that's what they yeah. like to say, correction. We were kidding. Yeah. We didn't know that was we, the wrong price for Bitcoin. We're going to correct it. We made a mistake. And then it keeps going up after that, which is, which is like, no, this is just nothing goes in a straight line. Things go up in a bumpy line. Right. That's always the question. Is it still going up? Because it's hard to tell when it's a bumpy line. Is it still going up? Or is this the part where we all find out we were dumb? <laughs> uh, I don't think you guys were dumb at all. The Bitcoin price right now, according to Google, is 7672 Right. That's, uh, see, compared to, say, months ago, that's a ridiculous price. This is going to be a very frustrating conversation. Because, like, you're always in the back of your mind, oh, if only I had, oh, if only, if only you'd gone against your common sense and got out before the bubble burst, if only, 
you know, or if only you avoided buying something that was like twice as expensive as it was a couple of weeks ago, then if only. <laughs> oh, my God. It's a lot of if onlys. If only. You know, people were saying this back in 2011. And it was at, you know, 350 a share. Mm -hmm. 350 a Bitcoin, I should say. I want to say share because mm -hmm. you know it's like a stock. Yeah, but it was at three fifty of three dollars. And I'm not saying three hundred fifty dollars oh. of Bitcoin. Yeah, in you know like 2011, I think I you know the dates are hard to get exactly right. I think it was 2011. It was like three fifty, and then it went up to like thirty. It went over thirty. Thirty dollars. Thirty dollars, yeah. and then it then it got some notoriety, and people. Yeah jumped in and then it went right back to like under ten dollars and then everyone's like ah suckers who bought it at 30. oh you guys are a bunch of suckers yeah. you could have had it at nine dollars yeah like like but no we're not gonna buy it at nine dollars either right now because it could still go down <laughs> it could be worth it shouldn't be worth nine dollars for one of these stupid imaginary tokens that don't even exist right. in the real world exactly. so no certainly we're not going to buy it at nine dollars either anyone who bought it at 30 is really stupid and if you buy it at nine dollars now you're you're also stupid well so here we are it's seven thousand and six hundred something i'm realizing very quickly Bitcoin. that this conversation is just gonna make me feel worse <laughs> and worse about myself but let's talk about this one dip because i think this is interesting and i just wanted to understand why it happened. So what is this deal about this expected hard fork? All right. So people yeah. got all excited because there had been this proposal amongst all of the largest Bitcoin miners in the world that they were going to change the Bitcoin protocol and do what's called a hard fork. Now, hard fork is a problematic term. Because it means a couple of different things. And people often conflate them. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. In its essence, a hard fork is a change in the Bitcoin protocol where if you run an implementation of the old version of the protocol, you won't accept the same transactions as somebody running a new version of the protocol. Mm. And that has the potential for creating a hard fork. Now, it's the reason it's a hard fork is that a regular, just a fork in the blockchain, right? Because it's a chain of blocks. We haven't, you know, people should listen to the previous one where we went into more depth. So if blockchain is, is basically blocks of data that are connected to previous blocks of data by, you know, cryptographic signatures, which prove that you didn't fake this. And that's as much as I'm going to go into it. Yeah. So when you have a, a fork in the blockchain, some people are creating blocks on one end of the network that are different than the blocks that are on the other end of the network. And there's a fork and somebody's going to lose out because whichever fork consumed the most energy, and that's called proof of work, it, it, the protocol says that fork wins and that will beat out the other fork. But a hard fork is a situation is you've got people running two different versions of the protocol and the winning fork isn't valid for half the network. And now you got a hard fork because it's a hard situation to deal with. Mm. So this is what happens when you change a protocol like Bitcoin. And what's confusing about it is the idea of a fork is in the code. You change the code on a project, on like a public, you know, open source project, you fork the code. It's the code that changed. Yeah. Right? So there's a lot of confusion around what's a fork. Because any kind of... Oh, I see. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So any kind of change in a code and somebody starts a new project off of your open source project, that's a fork. This is different. Yeah. Anytime you have part of your network saying the latest block is this and another part of your network saying the latest block is this and that's another that's kind of fork. fork and you got your hard fork where that situation is caused by changing the protocol and then people started saying well anytime you have a change in the protocol that would invalidate the previous version that in itself is a hard fork oh, <laughs> it's okay. almost like 
you forked our protocol. We're not even talking about reality yet. They call <laughs> the change in the protocol itself a hard fork before it even causes the condition that the hard fork was named after, you know, a, f a fork that's hard to resolve <laughs> in this. Anyway, it's all super confusing. So you got to be careful to understand, you know, what people mean when they say hard fork or a fork and 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 yeah. uh, it's pretty forked up. Uh. Sorry, that was that wasn't me. I didn't say that. That was not me. <laughs> I will remind everyone that Andy Ofeish is a comedian. Yeah. And we didn't even do introductions yet. I just no. started right into this this nonsense. So here's what happened. Yeah. Okay. I'm Andy Ofeish, and I was in a Bitcoin startup for a couple years that was very exciting and then failed. It was called uh, Bitcoin Armory. We made software for securing your private keys that you use to protect your Bitcoin holdings. And if you're at all interested in that, just Google Bitcoin Armory and you'll find resources online. And you're a software engineer. And I'm a software engineer. Okay. And here's the thing about Bitcoin Armory. It takes a software engineer to run it <laughs> and make it work properly. Otherwise, you might as well just go ahead and use a, a, an online service or one of the many other simpler uh, ways of managing your own Bitcoin. Right. So we have a following. And people that own a lot of Bitcoin, well, their go-to move is to hire somebody to run our software and protect their Bitcoin because right. it's really it's the safest thing. So uh, that's now. Bitcoin Armor. Yeah. Yeah. And I run it myself and I'm struggling with it at the moment, trying to get the latest version working on an offline computer because that's the main thing we do with Bitcoin Armory is we run the software that protects your private key on an offline computer. Well, as you can imagine, you can't just install software the normal way yeah. on an offline computer. Yeah. Because you want to make sure that offline computer's never been online and no hacker ever had a shot at getting to it. Wow. So that's the idea behind the software. And and getting it to run on an offline computer is, is a little challenging. Also, you don't want to run it in Windows. It'd be really easy to get our software running on an offline Windows computer. But again, you really want to protect your Bitcoin, don't run your security software protecting your private key on Windows because, you know, most of the malicious software in the world is written to run on Windows. So you don't do that, right? You run it on Linux. So, you know, I'm trying to get the latest version of software working on the latest version of Ubuntu Linux, and it's a pain in the neck, and it's not anything I would ever tell somebody new to Bitcoin to do. But, you know, if you own a chunk of Bitcoin, maybe not a millionaire's worth, but could be a hundred thousand air, even doesn't matter how much it is. If it's a big chunk of your savings, you know, you want to do it properly. Yeah. So you're better off going with the simpler solution is what I'm saying. Yeah. Or if you're super nerdy, go ahead, check out Bitcoin Armory and see how you can get it installed properly. All right, so that's me. That's my entry into the Bitcoin world. So now yeah. back to this latest hard fork. You want to talk thing. about this one? Segwit 2 All right, segregated witness doubling the block size. Yeah. And it's basically two changes wrapped up in one proposal. And we got all these big Bitcoin miners who collectively control 80% of the hash power on the network say well here we're gonna we're gonna basically do a double hard fork uh-huh <laughs> you know what i mean i uh actually i don't know if the segregated witness i think the segregated witness part of it it was a hard fork um and also doubling the block size also a hard fork because both of those are changes that will allow data onto the blockchain that would not have been allowed in the old version and that produces the potential for your network to have two different versions of the single public ledger. One where all the people are running the older software yeah, and yeah. won't accept the data that has been validated by the newer software. Mm. Do you have like an analogy from the feudal era that you can use? Uh, You're talking about the Byzantine generals. The problem. Byzantine generals problem. So that's that is a hypothetical, yeah. imaginary problem 
the yeah. concept behind Bitcoin solved this Byzantine general's That's problem. That's episode one of that, Bitcoin Yeah, so go back podcast. to that. That's a whole thing. Yeah. Now this, if you want an, an analogy to Bitcoin, you got to go way back to, I forget what they were called, these stones. These were giant stones in uh, like a Polynesian ancient culture. I think they were from like Pacific Island cultures. Mm. Mm. And they realized how currency worked. If you basically owned a giant stone and these giant stones became too big to move. So basically any neighbors near one of these giants, anyone that lived near a giant stone, basically collectively knew who owned it. Because they were there as witnesses when somebody said, now you own this giant stone. Great, yeah. we're not going to bother moving it. <laughs> it's just everybody that lived near that giant stone knew who owned it. And you just would say, hey, I own this. No, you don't. Everybody near you would beat you up if you kept saying that. I see. <laughs> you know, I imagine. I don't know. Yeah. But that's how Bitcoin works. I can't believe you just came up with that analogy. Just like, <laughs> totally threw that at you, and you hit it out of the park. Well, because there's no other there's no other form of monetary system that comes close to replicating this idea that you know a Bitcoin is this imaginary concept, and we have some public ledger wherein all these people said, "Well, we run the software, and we know you own that Bitcoin." Along with, we know who owns the other, right. you know. I don't know how many exist right now, actually, but ultimately it will not be more than 21 million. It was somewhere on here. It was somewhere around 16 million. Oh, there it is. Okay. 16 and a half million. Yeah, 16 and a half million Bitcoins have been mined since it was created, and there will only ever be 21 million. So um, basically, the way the protocol works is every four years, half of what's left will get mined. Okay. So we've been at this for, what, nine, ten years? Yeah. So that comes out about right. So in the first four years, half of it was mined. In the next four years, half of what was left wow. was mined. So that's about 75%. And so now we're somewhere between 75 and 82.5% of yeah. Bitcoins. And as we will be because it's between years 8 and 12 of Bitcoin existing. And then after the 12th year of Bitcoin existing, it'll get halved again. And so then for over the next four years, half of what's left will get distributed so that'll be like you'll go from 82 percent up to whatever 90 something it'll keep having what it gets given out after every four years so why 21 million it just worked out that way yeah they just mapped it out on a big calendar and said all right we're going to be doing this for 140 years wow and every four years it's going to half and half and half and half and half and then finally around the year 2140 i'm like no no, we're done. There's no more. You can't have more. The world will only have 21 million. By then, who knows what the world will be like anyway. So that's exciting, right? That yeah. That's kind of a great invention, and it solved a previously unsolved mathematical problem, and that's Bitcoin. All right, so why did they have to increase the size of the blocks or double the size from a meg to two megs? Is this a scaling? Like where the It's a scaling issue. People are fond of saying how energy inefficient Bitcoin is, yeah. right? The energy is a function of how much people spend on energy and technology to mine these Bitcoins, and that was a whole other conversation in the previous podcast. Yeah. Right. But if you only ever have one megabyte worth of transactions in one block which takes about 10 minutes to form then you're limiting your usability as more people get on right and and what will happen is every transaction has a fee and that fee will determine whether or not the miners that construct these blocks will include your transaction in their next block so you got to pay you got to pay. Mm. You got to pay more to get included, mm. right? So that's what's happening. And I think a lot of these miners were reluctant to increase the number of transactions allowed in a block because they were getting more money. Right. But now it's a point where the system is clogged and they could still have uh, pressure, you know, supply and demand for space in a block at double the size. So they said, well, actually, we're going to make more money if we just double this now. So they did. But now a bunch of people 
And uh, the core developers said, hey, why aren't we involved in this decision? And uh, all these miners said, oh, no, it's, it's our computers. We get to install what we want to install, and we all want to install the same thing. And so 80% of the mining power and the, those few people, and that's what a lot of people say is a problem, right? Is not that many entities that control 80%. And so now they they could pick a version of the software that only they like and will lock in mm. their control. They want to lock in their control. They always want to be the same people controlling 80% of the mining power because that's, you know, that's that's worth a lot. So so they went off and said, hey, we're going to run this, even though it was open source and everyone could look at the code and say, all right, that's pretty, that's a pretty good improvement. Maybe not exactly what we wanted, but yeah. it's still it's still a pretty good improvement, right? And so there's a lot of controversy. So the seg wit, segregated witness part fixed a couple of known issues with uh, the Bitcoin protocol. It enables what's called the Lightning Network, which is a whole thing, which would be complicated to get into. But the way to think about Lightning Network is pipes, wherein Bitcoin can be treated like a liquid and you control instantaneously the flow of Bitcoin through these pipes. That's a whole exciting, complicated thing. And this coming, because segregated witness, that fork happened. That happened. And they split it up and they said, well, we're going to do the segregated witness part first. Oh, you know what it is? I can't explain segregated witness. Here's what happens. Is that signature that everyone used yeah. to determine whether or not this transaction was valid yeah. and can get into the block. Well, that signature, that cryptographic signature, went in the block with the transaction. And if I could give the too long, didn't read version of it, that just means segregated witnesses, you know what, we're gonna stop storing that signature in the block. We don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. It's already been verified by all the miners. Right. Otherwise, it never would have made it in a block. So we don't need to keep checking that cryptographic signature. Yeah. We can exclude it from the block and save space for more transactions. Also that fix something called transaction malleability. And that's a whole other wow. uh, tricky explanation. But the way you can describe transaction malleability simply is that it was a little trick people could use to change the data of the transaction without changing the meaning of the transaction. Mm. So your transaction could have been changed under the covers while keeping everything else the same, except for this 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 uh, other piece of data that uh, people were counting on to keep track of everything. So basically what was happening is uh, transaction malleability was letting people change the data of a transaction, tricking large automated exchanges into thinking that a transaction didn't happen no oh. <laughs> and they were using it to basically double spend on these large exchanges and until the large exchanges were able to solve their software problems people were tricking these large exchanges into letting them double spend their bitcoin so that is that is all water under the bridge all those exchanges fixed their loophole but mm -hmm. now the protocol is fixed too and and it's allowing newer technology to be built on top of it and it's and it's closing up some issues that were known issues that a lot of people had to write software around so that was pretty much universally agreed as a really good improvement and this doubling the size of the block was not so universal and they recently called it off because it was very unpopular, which to me was kind of sad because I thought it was really a needed improvement, would have made Bitcoin more usable, more people would be using it now if they had increased the block size. Why is that? Because it costs less to send a transaction. The software that lets people interact with Bitcoin becomes less complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, I know with Bitcoin Armory, the people who maintain it now had to off add a feature called bump where you can automatically bump your transaction fee because you pick how much you pay. 
So that just makes sending anything on the Bitcoin network more complicated. Mm. I, how much do I pay? I don't know how much I have to pay yeah. to make sure this transaction happens within the next few hours. Yeah. Otherwise, your transaction sits on the network and nobody wants to touch it. And while it's sitting on the network, it's tying up your Bitcoin. So uh, the software I used to work on recently added a feature called Bump, where you could like say, oh, it's been sitting there for a couple of hours. Let me bump up the fee and resend it. Oh, I see. Yeah. So that that's that just makes it more complicated. Yeah. And and if you uh, increase the size of the blocks, then it's less complicated. But if you increase the size of the blocks, then there's more resources in participating in the network. And some people were saying that, well, having large blocks concentrated the mining power amongst the few that have the uh, resources and the power to run it. But I, I feel like a lot of folks uh, really didn't understand the extent, the amount of advantage, the amount of effect, the amount of the negative. The negative was was being uh, exaggerated. Mm. Right? I see. So that's what I think. I don't know. This is, it's very subjective. Yeah. yeah. The thing that bothered me about the whole debate is people would come in and say things very matter-of-factly. And I was like, do you have any idea how complicated this is? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and you're saying, well, it's going to increase uh, centralization. And I'm like, well, one, centralization, you know, is what we have now with, like, credit cards and right. stuff. Centralized trusted point of source. attack. Trusted yeah. third parties. Right. Yeah. And and Bitcoin's supposed to be decentralized, right? right? And people oh, have this idea of what decentralization means, right? I think decentralization means, well, anyone can compete. Anyone can run a full node. Anyone can mine Bitcoin. That's decentralization. Yeah. And somehow a lot of folks felt like, well, decentralization means that it has to be fair and anyone can win. And I'm like, no, it means anyone can compete. There are actual realities in this world that give people, specifically really rich, politically connected people in China, an advantage over you, a suburban, comfy, yeah. wannabe right. Bitcoin miner with your tech knowledge, and you want to participate and be a part of the revolution. Sorry, you're going to lose to the 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 person in china with huge resources and political connections yeah <laughs> you're right. gonna lose to them right, right. they scale you yeah. don't you don't yeah. scale you're in your you're in your basement you right. don't scale you don't yeah. win sorry you can compete you get to compete that's decentralization does that affect the price of bitcoin at all the fact that the ability to mine bitcoin successfully becomes more and more of an exclusive process no, that has nothing to do with the price of Bitcoin. Nothing to do with it. Now, if you want to understand the price of Bitcoin, first thing you have to look is where is the exchange volume happening? And right now it's happening in Japan. So whatever's happening in Japan, whether it's because it's just suddenly really popular or somebody in, uh -oh. in Japanese tech culture created a really easy way to use Bitcoin, mm -hmm. or maybe they're monkeying around with the monetary. I don't, I don't system in Japan. I don't know. Here's the thing. You look where the exchange volume is happening. Right now, it's Japan. You go get involved with Japanese culture and society and politics, and then maybe you can answer that question. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's what's going on there. All right, back to the price jumps and the hard forks, sure. right? So the dip was caused by the f announcement that the fork wasn't going to happen. Is that right? All right. So here's what happened earlier in the year. I don't remember exactly when, but Bitcoin Cash came along. Right. Okay, good. Let's as soon as the segregated SegWit 2X, as soon as that proposal would to add segregated witness and double the size of the blocks came out. Mm -hmm. And there was all these people that were upset about it. A group of those people said, well, screw you guys. We're going to create our own hard fork. We're not going to do segregated witness. And we're going to do eight megabyte blocks. Oh, I see. And we're going to call it Bitcoin Cash. Yeah. And Catch we you. don't need majority hash power. We're just going to create a fork. Right? Yeah. And we're going to have these big blocks and no segregated witness. And they did some other things to make sure to protect themselves against attacks. Because part of the problem with forking without the majority hash power, anyone else who has majority hash power can mess around with your blockchain and also you're offering people a chance to mine 
Bitcoin for a lot less. And it just sort of will bring your fork, the network on your fork, to a grinding halt. And unless your fork has a significant amount of hash power, it'll slow down and be unusable. All right, so they did this, right? And yeah. everybody who I know that knows and understands how all of this works, it's like, oh, I can't work. Well, here's what they didn't realize. A couple of the largest mining operations said, we like this. We like that there is a fork with eight megabyte blocks. We like that we have all this mining power, right? Yeah. Well, why don't we just mine on this fork at a loss? And two of the biggest hashing powers in the world say, yeah, we're just going to go over there and mine on it. Wow. <laughs> and they did. And then other stuff happened and it got really screwy. And there was like some weird kind of hashing power fluctuations that actually sort of even m messed around with the original Bitcoin. Mining power went through waves as mining power went back and forth between the two. And so it was interesting, but it worked. And then it became worth money. And, and so now, if you yeah. had Bitcoin before the fork, you had Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash after the fork, and then Bitcoin Cash started going up in price. Oh. So people got the idea that, whoa, if there's going to be a hard fork, buy in before the hard oh. fork. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Oh. And then yeah. when it forks, you're going to have twice as many oh. tokens and these new tokens they might not be worth as much as the original yeah but it's gonna be free money so people get excited now about hard forks instead of scared but then they're still kind of scared but then they're excited enough to buy into it because well you certainly don't want to buy bitcoin after the hard fork because you won't get this other goodie yeah that came along with it so people started thinking of hard forks mm. coming up as buying opportunities Interesting. Because you're basically, you're getting two bets for the price of one. Yeah. And then the fork happens. Well, then what's the price going to do? You know, people realize, oh, that didn't really turn into a new currency. Well, let me get out of this risky investment. I don't understand what's happening. Right. <laughs> I think that might have been sort of what happened. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. here's what happened. They, they called off the doubling the block size part because, it, because too many people complained about it. And I think it just goes to show that these people that are controlling the mining power on Bitcoin, they want to make everyone happy. Even if everyone is unhappy about something they want to do, they're not going to do it because they don't want to risk everyone exiting Bitcoin because they're not happy with what the big miners are doing. Right. Because they, now we have choices. Bitcoin Cash is right there. Now you have the choice. You can have small blocks with segregated witness, or you can have eight megabyte blocks without segregated witness, which is, by the way, without segregated witness for now. Mm -hmm. As right. soon as something yeah. is built on segregated witness and it's awesome and people like it, I think Bitcoin Cash could handle adding segregated witness. You know what I mean? They just have to decide, all right, here comes a hard fork. We're going to add a segregated witness. Can we just talk about segregated witness one more time and what that means? All right. In a nutshell, it means you're taking the cryptographic signature yeah. out of the oh, transaction okay. data before you put it in the block. Okay. So we're segregating okay. the witness to your transaction, which is this cryptographic signature, mm -hmm. from the data that's going to go in the block. Okay. Because it was determined that you don't, if you do some other quick little changes here and there, you don't need to have that signature carried around on the blockchain forever. Right. Which, by the way, is yeah. still happening because unless you specify that you're using a segregated witness transaction, unless you're making your transaction segregated, it's not. Yeah. And the software that's out there today isn't messing around with segregated witness okay. right now. I mean, as things come online, it's an option. So if I were to develop software to do Lightning Network, right? Well, it's necessarily going to have segregated witness in it. So all the transactions that are part of this Lightning Network, they're all going to be segregated witness transactions. 
Or let's say you're super nerdy and you think segregated witness is cool, right? So then you're going to have a version of the software that's built on top of Bitcoin making transactions that are segregated witness transactions. So so then you're you're doing segregated but how many of you are there? There's you know yeah. I mean the, yeah. you have to consciously have decided that I'm sending out transactions that are segregated witness otherwise still most people aren't doing that. Right. So by default the signature is still there. It's not segregated. Yeah, regular old transaction. Your signature yeah. is there on the transaction, and it's now stored in the blockchain along with every other signature that ever happened, and that's a significant amount of data that does not need to be in the blockchain. Right. Got that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so Bitcoin Cash is it's a whole separate entity, right? It's, now it's on its own chain. Its and own if you owned Bitcoin before a certain date, you also own Bitcoin Cash, assuming okay. you didn't sell it. Okay. <laughs> so you've got both. I got right. both because yeah. I still haven't gotten my new offline signer working. And part of what I want to do with that new offline signer is sign Bitcoin cash transactions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so so until, yeah, right? until I finish mm -hmm. my uh, super secure offline Bitcoin signer, my Bitcoin cash is is not liquid. So, <laughs> And so Bitcoin cash has the same max supply, 21 million. But then I don't know. Circulating supply sixteen point eight million, which is what Bitcoin is, right? Bitcoin at, might have a little bit less. Sixteen point five. Yeah, because Bitcoin Cash accelerated their block production because mm. they monkeyed around with the adjustments on difficulty, and that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Now. But and it, that, it's hard to talk about any of this without getting technical. Yeah, that's <laughs> all right. And then Bitcoin Cash is already at twelve seventy seven. It has been surging. That's crazy. Well, so here's right what here. it is: they failed to get the two X in there. So everyone that is a fan of cheaper transactions and thinks that's the way to go, well, the transactions are super cheap on Bitcoin Cash. Not only is it you know, eight times as large on a block, but, you know, not as many people are using it. They're not even really filling up one megabyte. We could, you could look it up. Yeah. If you look up, you know, the Bitcoin Cash uh, blockchain monitor somewhere, you could see exactly how big the Bitcoin Cash blocks are. And they certainly aren't anywhere near eight megabytes because yeah. there's not that many people are using it. And just to review... The block size is literally the size of the file that contains all the Bitcoin transactions. I'm kind of taking a step back. Yeah, well, the block size is how much data can fit into one cryptographically signed chunk that's going on the blockchain. So each link on the blockchain is a block, right? It's a chain of blocks. And that block has a bunch of transactions in it. And those transactions take up data. So your blocks are bigger. You can fit more transactions in one block of transaction data. So 8 megabytes is really looking towards the future then, right? Yeah, that, well, I uh... mean, it's a big bump. And But what's going to happen is if they start filling up, it's going to take a lot of storage to keep track of all that on a full node. And I say a full node, what I mean is a node on the Bitcoin Cash network. Now we're talking about Bitcoin Cash. That is participating in the network, passing around all of the information of, about the blocks that have been found by the miners. Now a full node could mine or not. You can run a full node without mining. And so a full node basically necessarily has the entire blockchain on a computer somewhere. So you basically have to have a big fat disk and you have to have pretty good processing power just to get the blockchain onto your computer. And people are concerned about that. If, if you make the blocks too big, well, over time, it's just going to eat up more and more resources on somebody's computer if they're going to run a full node. And that will restrict the number of full nodes on your network. Sure. And then that will centralize control of the Bitcoin network because only people yeah. with the resources to run 
really powerful computers will be able to participate in the network. Well, people say this, but they leave out all of the numbers and the details. They just say it's going to be hard. Well, how much harder? How many more resources? And how does this compare with Moore's Law? Are you familiar with Moore's Law? Yeah. All right. People like to quote Moore's Law. Well, Moore's Law is very relevant here because it means processing power and this size and the amount of you know, resources in your standard cheapo computer is just going to keep going up and up. And it's going to go up at about the same rate that Bitcoin's increasing. So Bitcoin just has to avoid outpacing Moore's law. Right, sure. So people that like to say the problem with big blocks is nobody's going to be able to run a full node. I'm like, well, show me the numbers. Let's, right. let's, let's do some math here. Right. Make your case with numbers. Don't just say more, right. more. It's funny, it's Moore's law. Yeah. <laughs> but people like saying, well, it's going to be more difficult. It's going to be more this. It's going to be worse this way. How much? How much worse? How yeah. much more? Yeah. But no, nobody actually who's really concerned about these things gets into the details on it. They just only have that black or white. Well, it's more, so that's bad. It's, it's, it's worse. That's, that's not good. I'm like, wow, much worse. It doesn't sound like it would be something that would be that hard to compute with the pace of whether it's going to outpace. Well, here's the thing. There's a lot of inputs into that. So your estimates on those inputs are relevant. And that's kind of why people don't get into the details of it. Mm -hmm. It's And that's why it's a subjective question. That's why I only ask people, just treat it like a subjective question. Don't yeah. don't treat it like a matter of fact. <laughs> it's a subjective question. You know, do your own estimates. Come out with your own numbers. And then I can look at those numbers and say, yeah, I don't believe that input. I don't believe that's necessarily true. But, you know, everyone can make their own assessment. That's why, you know, these are subjective things. So that was a very brief correction, and now Bitcoin is right back up to 76. I guess it went past 8,000 and then took yeah. a dip to like 7,600. But anyway, it's back up. Oh, also, when it went down, Bitcoin Cash went up. Oh, <laughs> People traded their Bitcoins for Bitcoin Cash. I think all the big block fans got out of Bitcoin and went to Bitcoin Cash when they realized they weren't getting their double-sized blocks. Oh, I see. But here's what's interesting is now Bitcoin's up. And Bitcoin Cash is still where it <laughs> they're was. Both up. No, they're so both here's up. what that tells me. When Bitcoin, the 2X part, of uh, Segwit 2X, when the 2X part got called off, yeah, a bunch of people said, well, all right, I want big blocks. I got to go to Bitcoin Cash. So they did that. And the price of Bitcoin went down. And the price of Bitcoin Cash went up. And everybody's happy. I, what I mean is then the price of Bitcoin went up also. Now everybody's happy. So what yeah, happened? Right, 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 right. What, did they all change their mind? No, yeah. something else happened. Yeah, what happened? <laughs> I think uh, Square. Did you read the Square? No. Story? Oh, Square at some point said, hey, we're going to include oh. Bitcoin in our platform. Wow. And so okay. then a bunch of people like, well, Square is involved with Bitcoin. Now that's really going to add to the utility of yeah. Bitcoin. Yeah. So then they went up for a different reason. See, there's always a, a different reason. So it'll go down for one reason, and then it'll come up for another reason. And people try to make sense of it. And I'm like, well, there's a ton of reasons. And like I said, you know, a lot of the Bitcoin trades are happening in Japan. So who knows what's happening over there to make the price go up. Right. So why did Squ Square went with Bitcoin, not Bitcoin Cash? Oh, who knows? They could do any of it. But right. the point is, is they, yeah. they start out looking at Bitcoin. Yeah. Right. They could start out looking at Bitcoin. Who knows? Yeah. Whatever they start out with. That's the thing. You know, as soon as they say in a press release, well, we're looking at this. You know, if they got involved with Ethereum, then you'd see Ethereum's price go up. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, since since the previous podcast, right, Ethereum was surging just yeah. before our previous podcast. Notice that Ethereum has sort of stayed where it was at yeah. since then. Isn't that interesting? Do you have any theories around that? Why that's happening? Yeah, because <laughs> Ethereum's got all these hot features that people are excited about. Yeah. Well, I think they cram too much into it. It's too complicated. Oh. It's too yeah. complex. There's and, a lot to be said for that. It's not like nobody can understand it, right? I mean, there's certainly a lot of really smart, smarty, smart pants 
are like, hey, we're smarter than you Bitcoiners. Look what we created. This is even better. We yeah. took we took your invention and we added this on it and we added that on it. Yeah. Well, here's the problem. I think it's too complex. So if I'm going to store a lot of my wealth in something, I at least need to know somebody I trust that understands it. Yeah, right. <laughs> if not understand <laughs> it myself. And I feel like when you make it too complex, you limit the circle of trust that surrounds the people that understand it because there's only a small number of people that really understand it. Absolutely. And then other people are creating stuff on top of it that nobody understands. And But they, some people are jumping in on it anyway, and they're finding out. It's like, oh, wait a second. This thing that I jumped in on that was built on top of Ethereum, it's not that solid. Yeah. <laughs> and how do you know it's not that solid unless you understand it? So, you know, I think a lot of people are getting burned and they're realizing, oh, we got to understand something before we invest in it. I'm not saying Bitcoin's easy to understand, but it's incrementally easier than Ethereum is to understand. And Ethereum is understanding all of the potential uh, problems with software built on Ethereum and the complexity of it. And in a lot of cases, you're exposing yourself to denial of service attacks that haven't been invented yet and ethereum is complicated enough that there could be really devastating attacks on the network that haven't been invented yet mm -hmm. because it's really complex mm -hmm. and um the thing about bitcoin is some really uh high-powered brains some people that are really uh you know world uh I don't know what, what I'm trying to say. Uh, known around the world as crypto experts came out pretty early on and said, man, I thought I could break Bitcoin. Can't be broken. And there's strength in numbers, too. I mean, there's people take confidence in the adoption rate yeah. of Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, so. Yeah. And, and see, here's the thing. Ethereum is lacking those worldwide yeah. accepted cryptographic experts saying man i tried to break ethereum yeah can't be broken no those people are saying tried to break ethereum i got some ideas still working on it because mm. ethereum's really complicated i can't say with any kind of certainty that it can't be broken <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know what i mean so that's going to limit that's going to limit its its uh its usefulness in the area of storing wealth right people yeah. will use ethereum they're not going to store a lot of capital in it and that's the yeah. difference between ethereum and 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 bitcoin and ethereum is critical because it's it's a proving ground for technology so guaranteed at some point something is going to get built on top of ethereum and it's going to be awesome and then somebody else is going to figure out how to build that same thing on top of Bitcoin. And then it's really going to take off. Even better. Yeah. Do you think any Bitcoin people are working on trying to take out Ethereum? No, I don't think they have to. I don't think there's... They don't have to. You know what? It, here, here, here's an analogy. Somebody said, well, you know, what would happen if terrorists decided to start forest fires? Well, here's why they don't. Because those forest fires just start on their own. Yeah. And the terrorists aren't going to be able to take much credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> so why would anyone, you know, endeavor to do something to Ethereum when the big knock on Ethereum is there's going to be some attacks on Ethereum yeah. that are coming, usually, you know, from somebody that figures out a way to make money off the attack, right? I mean, so I don't know. Here's the thing could be nobody's attacking ethereum right now if i have a lot of my savings in ethereum that's not helping me sleep at night right <laughs> yeah <laughs> absolutely just because nobody's attacking it right now that's not security yeah <laughs> security is when everybody's attacking it and none of them succeed that's security right. <laughs> well put I have one last theory to throw at you about Satoshi Yakamoto. Oh, and what's your what's your uh, Satoshi theory? theory we I have a new theory about. that he is a time traveler.
So here's my question for you. Do you think time travel is an ancient technology? I'm not sure. I don't know. I mean, it could be. If Hold it's... on a second. Hold on a second. Here's my point. Yeah. You don't know. It could be, right? Yeah. Well, it would have to be. If time travel exists, it must be an ancient technology. Because they would have gone back in time. Are you saying time travel exists and nobody ever okay. went back? Yeah, right. To the origins of time? Yeah. And populated a pristine Earth? Why didn't that happen already? It should have been an ancient technology. In any universe where time travel exists... Are you trying to debunk my theory? No, I'm just trying to say that, you know, if time travel exists, it's an ancient technology. That's my theory. I'm, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. I, I saw the documentary on Bitcoin, and even in the, the document, they're like, we don't know who Satoshi is. We don't. I think there's a very good idea on who wrote the white paper. Now, whether or not they were also the brains behind the white paper, that's another question. In which case, that opens the door to the distinct possibility that Satoshi Nakamoto is an online pseudonym that a group of people sure. uh, yeah. contributed to the content, right? So in which case, it's not actually any one person. And I feel like the farther we go into this without anyone actually being discovered as the Satoshi, the more likely it is that it's just an imaginary online persona controlled by a group of people who stopped controlling it and probably threw away the key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would prove that any one of them was Satoshi. And, and they probably yeah. threw away the key that would allow any of them to spend those original bitcoins that were mined and have never been spent. How else do you the just disappear? The longer we go without anything being signed with that private key connected to Satoshi Nakamoto, the longer we go, the more likely it is that it isn't a single person. It isn't somebody. It's an online persona. Yeah. With pseudonym. a private key attached to it yeah. that I have strong belief may have been destroyed already. That probably makes more sense than the time travel. Well, the longer theory. we go, the longer we go, the more likely it is that that's the case. And here's another thing is like you take all what's written in the white paper and handwriting analysis and likelihood of who wrote those words, they point to one particular person who has been associated with the early. But even then, that person early could crypto have just been like a scribe. Could have just been right. somebody that said, hey, scribe, you have you some know. legal and writing skill and yeah. you can write things in a way. And I say the legal part because this guy is also a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> and and he was probably, you know, the person that contributed a lot of legal knowledge. Yeah. Right. Probably right. also yeah. was the person who actually put the white paper and the concepts in it down in written form. So that person, I'm not going to say their name because you could look it up. And yeah. also, I feel like there's a good chance that I'm mixing that name up with somebody who's actually a sports celebrity. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's how my brain works. Use your Google. Figure it out for yourself. That's awesome. And I think this person is not Satoshi Nakamoto, but I think this person actually wrote the white paper. So my last question was, I think I saw a statistic that Bitcoin transactions and Bitcoin mining is currently consuming 0.12% of the world's energy. Well, it's a lot because Bitcoin's worth a lot. The amount of money that people spend mining Bitcoin is a function of the block reward size. In monetary value so as mm -hmm. the price of Bitcoin goes up the energy spent to protect the network goes up do you think that this will affect the price ultimately or the ability for Bitcoin to to continue without a centralized source or well there isn't ever going to be any centralized source I mean you can't 
It's like saying, hey, when's somebody going to take over the internet? <laughs> Do you think people will work on greener methods of mining Bitcoin? Like oh, sure. Sure, that's happening now. People that are near hydropower, yeah. a lot of hydropower goes to waste. Uh, hydropower, you know, going through a dam that is not hooked up to some transport system is generally being wasted. Now, instead of hooking up hydropower to a transport system, you can attach some mining rigs to it and make some money off of that wasted power. Yeah. And it's renewable. Yeah. So there you go. You got that. The point is, is are those big operations? You know, it's the big operations. What kind of energy are they using? That's the only thing that really matters. Because they're the ones controlling a lot of, you know, the mining. And they're scaling it. And they're the ones spending all the energy. So it's really on, on the major miners of the world. Anyone else mining Bitcoin? Good. Good for you. But you're, you're a drop in the bucket. Right. But this isn't something that will spook investors, you think? Or like, what's the Moore's law of energy consumption? Has ecological impact ever gotten in the way of somebody's greed? Yeah, Has it so. ever? No. Really? <laughs> Not since last November, anyway. Bitcoin's electricity consumption as a percentage of the world's electricity consumption, 0.13%. Right. This is on Digiconomist. And it's going to keep going up as yeah. the price of Bitcoin goes up. Yeah, or if the price of Bitcoin tanks, if, if Bitcoin goes to the floor... Guess what happens to that number? That goes right down. So, Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Because fewer transactions or... No, because less money. There's less money to be made. They're going to waste less energy making less money. All right. What have I left out? Oh, here. Let me, let me predict the future. Yeah, Bitcoin. perfect. All right. Here's what I think is going to happen as killer apps, right? Yeah. Here's my killer app thing right pretty soon somebody is going to come up with a simple app right like that, paypal like as simple as paypal yeah and it'll just be on your phone and you run this app and you will be on a lightning network mm -hmm. and people can just tip you little bits of bitcoin you could uh babysit and hey pay the babysitter a little bit of bitcoin just install this app super easy now your babysitter has got some bitcoin right delivered to them on the lightning network right that's gonna happen it, it seems inevitable i mean you pay a babysitter in bitcoin you give her you know 40 bucks worth of bitcoin one night and a week later it could be worth double that so or it could be worth almost nothing. Or, or nothing, but that doesn't or seem to be happening. Or they could flip the switch on the app, wherein they instantaneously get cash in their PayPal account from the app, and then they have no exposure. Well, it'll cost a fee. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? So sure. you can either take the $40 in Bitcoin that you made off of babysitting and just keep it in Bitcoin, or have an Amazon gift card worth forty dollars, or course. yeah, get thirty five dollars in cash and PayPal. I mean, at that point, there's so much you could do marketing wise with co branding and stuff, yeah. and you know, Starbucks card, whatever, just trade it in the app for those cards, and those companies are paying to have their cards visible in the app. So that and here's covers the thing: the fee and... it'll be an open source app. Mm -hmm. It won't be any organization like paypal like right. Amazon. it won't right. be any trusted Total third, third it'll be an app yeah that'll be free yeah you put it on your phone yeah and it, it'll just run now running that app joining the lightning network right there might be um add-ons to that things that make it work better you know there there could be uh i have no idea what these things would be but you can do things in the app that make it work better and nicer and add more features. And you'll pay uh, micropayments for those features.
So it'll be just like it is now with in-app purchases, right? So there will be in-app purchases. It'll be it'll be just like the freeware and the free games we get addicted to on our phones that we download and start running for free. And now once we're hooked, people can sell us stuff in-app. And we, you know, individually, I might be smart enough not to get sucked into actually paying for this free app. But not everybody will, you know. There will be people like, "Oh, this is awesome! I can, I can, I can burn my Bitcoin paying for little add-ons and features, and sure. could be games built in on top of it from independent publishers." Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, who knows? Whatever. Th this this Lightning Network is going to get appified, and then everybody's in, and that'll be the killer app. So why hasn't that been built yet? Chicken and egg, right? You got to have users. Mm -hmm. Such a network is useless without users. You know, it's got to be built. There's got to be servers. People got to run these servers to serve up the app. Now, maybe somebody will create a bunch of these for free, or maybe that'll be part of the micropayment transaction. You get the app, right? And then you got to... You got to pay some micropayment to join in on these servers that are controlling the network that you're on. Maybe you can build it all on Amazon Lambda. That was another podcast right. episode I did with another friend of mine who works stuff at in Fidelity. the cloud. Right? These things are all yeah. gonna these things are all gonna be run in the cloud. Yeah. And um, I can't wait to see how it all comes out. You know? Yeah. Be good to get a finger in that. Right. Because the Lightning Network is going to not only enable the app and the simplified use of Bitcoin. It's going to enable the micropayments that are going to reward all of the people that are contributing content and contributing infrastructure to this network. So awesome. that's going to happen. Yeah. yeah. And then and then if if you need a reason to risk a chunk of your life savings on Bitcoin, that's your reason. And take an amount of money that you would have taken to Atlantic City or to buy lotto tickets. Take that amount of money. Buy some Bitcoin with it. You might be kissing it goodbye. But there's a really good chance that you're going to have quite a bit more money. And it'll be all ready to use on the new Lightning Network. 7600 seems like a lot of money, but... We could be having the same conversation six months from now. It could be at 76,000, right? Or theoretically. Hundreds of thousands. If such a lightning network to suddenly appear and teenagers all over the world were getting paid for chores on the lightning network through yeah. a free app. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Right? I mean, that's going to be nuts. That's what's going to make today's prices look like oh i wish i got in at right. under ten thousand per bitcoin exactly <laughs> maybe at that yeah. point it'll be uh micro bits yeah right. i wish i got in for under ten dollars per micro bit <laughs> i think maybe that's what <laughs> another thing people don't get is that the bitcoin can be subdivided into what how many eight zeros eight zeros you got eight zeros on the end of that decimal point which it would just be a hard fork to make it 20 zeros. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Is there a max value that it can reach where, okay, it can't be worth more than 20 million in Bitcoin or something? Could be, Is there? Yeah, it could be worth whatever. There is no limit. There's no upper limit. Well, I mean, how much would it be worth if it had universal uh, adoption. adoption? Yeah. How much yeah. would that be worth? Yeah. People have calculated it and said... If every monetary unit in the world today was converted into Bitcoin, it would be worth this much. Hmm. But, you know, I don't think that's so easy to figure out. Right. <laughs> I think it's a bit more complicated than that. And I also think there's a made up straw man argument for people to debunk Bitcoin and say, well, that can never happen. So Bitcoin's bogus. I'm like, well, how about maybe Bitcoin is just a platform that people are going to use and create awesome things on it? Yeah. <laughs> 
Maybe it doesn't have to take over the world's monetary systems right. to be a success. <laughs> how about not right it, away. How about it just changes the way cool people use money? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, then that'll be good. Yeah. That's a great wrap-up. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks. It was great being on the podcast. I love getting a chance to ramble on and have nobody say, hey, can you stop talking about Bitcoin? <laughs> <laughs> Andy, thank you again so much. It's been a delight. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Device Squad, the podcast for the mobile enterprise from Propellix. Lastly, I just want to add that everyone should head on over to the news and events section at Propellix.com and register for our upcoming webinar, Enterprise Mobile Trends and New Technologies for 2018 with special guest from Axway. Join Propellix senior mobile strategist Glenn Gruber on December 12th as he discusses the current state of enterprise mobility and the key emerging technologies that should be on your radar, if not on your roadmap. The technologies they'll discuss include Internet of Things, Augmented Reality, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning, and bots and conversational interfaces, and much more. Uh, next, Lee, Axway's Lior Brenman shares some real-world project insights around integrating these technologies into your enterprise mobile initiatives. Once again, head on over to the news and events section of propellix.com to register for that webinar today. All right, bye-bye. I feel like if anyone was listening to this and hoping to get some understanding, I didn't help. No. <laughs> I don't think I helped. I <laughs> That's crazy. I might have helped give people some ideas of what to Google for, to read about. So there, I, I've done that maybe. And and please enjoy reading about it because, you know, there is, there's so much. There's so uh, much. Yeah. This is a rabbit hole that is more like a labyrinth underground that goes way deeper than you could have imagined and extends to China. <laughs> <laughs>